you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, and for those watching this recording, there's a thousand people here. This is called Behind Portuguese P Pixels. And actually, we're celebrating 10 years anniversary on in December of the launch of the original Merlin Hotel Lisbon, which is this Portman is all about. So it's about the Merlin Hotel Lisbon and the Express Killer, two games that I'm going to talk here. Now, obviously, if you haven't played the games, this is going to completely ruin them for you. So, uh, sorry about that. But, um, yeah, you can. it's been a few years, so if you haven't played them yet, it's your fault. Right, so this is about this game and the second game. But before I go there, uh, let me just... Most of you here have known me at some point or know, and I've been making games for 20 years, give or take. Uh, I studied actually TV and cinema, and I worked as a motion graphics artist. So my aspirations at some point were, video games sucks, this is not a career, let me try. And so I worked as a motion graphics artist in TV, and I did study cinema. I did a lot of odd jobs, always related to art, posters, logos, you know, anything that was digital beginning in the late 90s I was doing, because very few people were doing it, there was good money there. Now, uh, over the past 20 years or so, I co-founded two video game companies, and I've taught about video games in schools and universities. I currently teach at IAD University uh, on a postgrad on uh, game design. Woohoo! And uh, I'm currently senior producer for the video game called Today at Mr. Kite, uh, which obviously always creates confusion every time. Is the meeting today today? Um, and, you know, and so on. So it's always funny. But before all this, and before we go into the postmortem, and I did this part of the presentation for the very few here that are not from Portugal, it is very interesting to know that there was no one making video games professionally in Portugal in the 90s. Nobody. Especially when I got started, okay? Why is that? And so there are three slides here that explained it. The Portuguese industry in the 80s was actually booming, which is very interesting to see. You had not only a ZX Spectrum that was manufactured in Portugal and exported to Poland and the United States, uh, but you also had games coming out that were actually paid, like we know that Gremlin Graphics paid 20,000 pounds back in the 80s to publish Alien Evolution uh, in the UK and I think a bit of Europe. And this was this was happening, like people were happening, but at some point, because of maybe our small mindedness or whatever happened, you know, games are for kids, I will now go and work in a real job somewhere else, I made some games, bye bye. And so what had happened is that there was a bit of a big void. Lots of my friends at the time, I was very young, had an Amiga computer, an Amstrad, uh, a Commodore Amiga, sorry, and there were a few educational games, plus a game called Gambis, and then Tubic launched in the 90s, but this was like a you know, desert, right? So where was I at the time? And yes, do come in, thank you very much. And uh, I was basically around 1991, there were a lot of ZX Spectrums because it was affordable and it, there was a lot of middle ca class uh, families that could afford them. So I had access to one and I got hooked. I, um, I actually started uh, coding uh, in Basic with ZX Spectrum, and I was like, this is amazing. I didn't make any games, but I liked it a lot and thought it was cool. And it took a while until I had money. My family didn't have money for a PC, so the first time I got a computer was in 97, where I got three paychecks altogether. I didn't spend, because I was still living with my parents, and I just bought a computer. I got a lot of books, self-taught, and because I was starting to work in 3D, I was doing 3D uh, all the time. I was working 3D at home, working 3D uh, at, at work, doing motion graphics. It was like I was learning as much as I could, and I thought this is the time to go back into video games, right? And finally, you know, what we do today, which is basically uh, online work, we were doing it back then with a software called uh, RERC, and we were doing demos. I found some like-minded colleagues, that, uh, friends that also there weren't that many people, there's nobody doing games professionally, lots of demos and things. And so we did our best. We did a lot of tech, we did a lot of demos as we went along. Now, we skipped forward a bunch of years. Uh, Seed Studios Limited uh, was formed, 
multiple prototypes, demos, and uh, finally a few commercial games like Toy Shop and Sudoku for Kids, and a few others here, and a few others that didn't happen. And finally, we grabbed all the money that we were making, and we said, let's go all in and do the game of our dreams. Let's do the games that we've been trying to do for a lot of years, right? And so that game was Under Siege. So Under Siege was funded by ourselves, banks, you know, I think I, next slide is about that. So basically, Under Siege was a PlayStation 3 exclusive. Uh, it was a real-time tactics game, which caused a lot of problems with marketing. We started calling it a real-time strategy because nobody knew what that was. Had a full campaign, four-player multiplayer online and offline. Had your own editor. It was our own engine with the, mixed with the Fire Engine 2 um, framework from Sony. You know, it had everything. It was like we went all in, we got all the money, we got everything. PlayStation Move support goes on. And why did we went all in? Because nobody wanted it, not even Sony. It was like everybody said, uh, it is so good looking. This is such a good game. You guys are going to clean up with sales. You don't have to worry about it at all. This is amazing. It's your own thing. And so we kept going. Um, it cost us around, at the time, this was at the time of launch of 2011, 1.3 million euros. And so what we did was we went to European funds. And for the first time in Portugal, we got European fund for a video game, which was around half a thousand, sort of, and I'll explain that. <laughs> we took loans from the bank in a sneaky way. Basically, the banks in Portugal did not get you loans normally for making video games, so we pretended we were uh, like renovating our kitchen. Everybody was renovating the kitchen at the same time, and we got each one got around 20 to 30,000. We never renovated our kitchens. We could put the money back into the game, right? Uh, and money that the company already had. Now, how did the game do? The game went to reviews and previews and all that, as you normally do. And we got OK reviews. Edge gave us a 7. They actually did the feature before the game came out, which was really good. Uh, IGN did not understand the game at all. Like, they had to put down the review and then put it back up again because somebody put the video of them not knowing how to play the game. It was, was a mess. But, you know, we were ready. We, this is going to sell. This is amazing. And when we had it all going for us, uh, Shit hit the fan, literally. So if you still remember, for those of you who are old enough, in 2011, there was an attack on the PlayStation Network, the PlayStation in general. And they had to shut down the entire system. This never happened again since. And when did it happen? Exactly on the week we were launching, right? So what happened then was Portuguese economy was in deep recession, so banks were not loaning any more money. There was nothing happening. European funds kind of stuck because we were in a recession, so the money that came from European funds were not getting to the companies because there was a hole in the country of money, and we were running out of money. So basically, I went back to basics. The uh, company declared bankruptcy in 2012, even though we tried, we had a lot of technology, a lot of stuff. And what did I do? I, I, I didn't just go back to zero. I went back to my mom's house. I lost everything. My, my colleagues lost houses, cars, you know, it was complete, complete waste. Uh, actually had loans to the bank to pay at the same time, so negative thousands, right? It doesn't appear in the bank negative thousands, but that's what it is, basically. So back to basic, I said to myself, this is silly. So many years, I'm not going to go and give up. I'm going to try again. I'm going to go back, back to the past of what I was trying to do early. So back to freelance, and I'm going to do it again. My friends gave up once, gave up in the sense they went to work for other companies. They went to the said, no, 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 no. I'm going to insist again. So I need to get out of my mom's house, and I need to do it again in a different way. Because video game devs are stubborn people. We are. We're very patient. We're stubborn. We insist that we are right, and we want to get back on that horse. So Nerd Bunkies was born in 2013. Uh, for those who don't know, now I think the law has changed, but if you were owner of a company that bankrupted, you need to wait five years to create another one, which creates a problem for loans and all those things. What I did was, I, we were in the European Union, Nerd Monkeys was founded in the UK. You, could, you can do this, you know, have multiple companies in the country, do not cross information, screw it, UK, let's go. So uh, I started a new company with Yogo, who is now probably doing his lecture. 
And we got started and we didn't have any money, right? But we were gonna make this game. So Murder in Hotel Lisbon was the premise. And for me it was simple, which was, I wanna do those games I was trying to do with the ZX Spectrum back in the early 90s when I was 10 or 11. How do I do this? Maybe this was the right time with pixel art to go back. It was the right timing as well. This was 2013. And let's go back and let's do it. So Detective Case and Clown Bot were born and in English, you know it as Detective Case, Case and Clown Bot in Murder Hotel Lisbon, and the sequel that is here in this postmortem. And in Portuguese, the games are known as Inspector Zé Robo Palhaço em Criminal Hotel Lisboa, Sin Intercidades. And again, the game came about because I was like, how do I turn this around and use what I learn and do games that are simple, fast to do, cheap, and put it on the market quick with a new company? 30 minutes, thank you. Um, so that's the genesis of this game. Uh, the idea was around already in the old company, and I was, you can come in if you want to. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but obviously, we were at the time doing Under Siege, and we had all this technology. The game was too basic to make sense to do in that company. So I grabbed that idea, which you can see had this very stupid name there on the right, uh, and I thought, well, I want to do this game that I wish I could have done back in the early 90s. Uh, and also, Portuguese history as industry has no history, as you saw. There were no point-and-click games made in the 90s. There were no games being made. There were like two games, right? Uh, and we were not making any games with stories. It's just, I have to have a story. It needs to be written. This needs to happen. At this point, all games here being made here were arcadey or puzzle games. It was like every game. It was really strange times. And I wanted to... Uh, because of my own personality, which I like to joke around, I really love the crazy humor, I wanted to tackle the comedy and stupidity from the 80s. For those of you, you know, I was a kid in the 80s, Portugal in the 80s, the type of humor was really, like nowadays it's really bad, right? You, really bad. You, nowadays it's considered like how in, on earth was this possible? But I wanted to tackle it and bring it to the, to the present. So what was the budget? Uh, that's me, Diogo, on top, and that's the uh, programmer, José, José Rua. Uh, I said to Diogo, look, I can do this in eight months. What's the budget that you can get me? And uh, he said, okay, 25K, we can get 25, which is nothing, right? Under siege cost 1.3 million. Okay, let's try that. Let's, so we went out of our way to spend as little as possible. Those offices are shared offices, spaces, with comic book friends that make comic books in Lisbon. I got all the stuff from, when a company goes bankrupt, so in case you don't know, when a company goes bankrupt, all the assets of the company are no longer mine. There's an administrator from the government that goes in and starts selling all that. What we did was, when we got out of there, some equipments disappeared, nobody knows to where and why, and where were they? Well, some of them were with me on the new company to make the new games. So another thing I did with a lot of the team was, look, we don't have a lot of money. I'll give you a percentage of sales. Always with, I would always tell, this might sell zero. And they will go, okay, but let's go, let's go. So smallest team possible, smart decisions with the money. And uh, again, the Lisbon studio, as I was saying, office and workplace. And because we didn't have meeting rooms, there was a Starbucks in Belém that actually has a room that nobody goes. And I used that for my meetings room. It was the top floor in Belém of Starbucks was great for hiring and doing all that kind of stuff. And we said, no publisher. I want to do the same as Under Siege, no publisher. We do it ourselves. Diogo was a bit like, why? He said, I hate this. I want to do it my own way. Let's go for it. So what was the formula of the game that I brought in? So it's the classic formula with a Portuguese twist. The name of the game is long, right? So immediately I said, well, if we have a long name, it sounds silly. So immediately you will associate it with funny, even if the name is not funny. This is a long name, makes no sense. And uh, the name of the characters were included in the name for marketing purposes, as well as the location, right? So the detective case and clown bot in Murder in Hotel Lisbon automatically connects a lot of stuff, right? And Diogo is, is there with his silly hair. Hey, man. Uh, and obviously there were a lot of, you know, uh, for those of you who know, that's Leslie Nielsen from uh, lots of movies that are very silly. That was a big inspiration. As well as our own Portuguese cop, um, Nicolau Breiner, which is very rough. It's like he's always very rough, very serious. And I thought that was a great combo for Detective Case. 
And then I wrote the, like multiple hats. I wrote the entire thing, I prepared the design, and I said, I need just this, this programmer, and let's see what we can do with the rest of the cache. So, <laughs> this is my initial drawings. This was moving already and working. And obviously, as you can tell, uh, maybe I was in a very different mental state because it was very dark and crude and rude. And the first tests, they didn't go very well. I said, this is too dark. The humor was really dark, was really bad. And uh, that's the final game up there, the same character, the exact same three characters. And so what we did was we grabbed some of the money and we said, we have a very good friend who does comics and he's actually a very famous artist in Lisbon. There's a lot of his illustration all around. I talk with Nunu. He was in the same studio because it was a co-work, so he's right on, down the hall. And let's give it a twist and make it a bit more colorful. And obviously, and we changed the name of the game because it wasn't the original one you saw. So Nunu grabbed my designs and started doing his. Um, they were amazing. Like we, we barely tweaked what he did originally. I would gave him like a, a, like a very short period of time for him, like a week or something, to do this one to two weeks. Said I'm going. This is going to go fast. I gave him the um, like bold colors. You know, no shading. Even though he shaded, I'm going to do it in pixel art. Needs to work like this. And obviously, Nunu also is very fond of the ladies being very you know, have big assets, said, no, 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 we have to reduce. And then we went through several iterations of characters. This is one of the important characters. Um, anyway, the art style evolved in what you see now, which is obviously a big difference and looks much more striking and original and different. So that was a good, great plus. And uh, to keep it low cost, I needed to be smart about the mechanics and the way characters interacted. So. All of the characters are, I had to animate it all. I had to convert it to pixel art, animate it all. So I limited to idle, talk, and walk, that's it. If you feel like there are more animations in the game, only, only the main characters have a few more. The other ones don't have, it's a lie. It's, it's like you're projecting, they don't have. Uh, and uh, all action was done in a single plane, left and right, no up and down. So I kept it as basic as possible. I even reduced frames whenever I could because it was enough to just to seem like they were correct. And uh, I went really fast with all of this. So, and then you have base rules. How many, much time do I have? 30 Still 30 minutes? Uh, okay, it was like 30 minutes, 20 minutes ago. Okay, 20 minutes. So again, it's supposed to be an old school game, but obviously I could not use the color palette of the spectrum. That doesn't make any sense, it would be horrible. But I was using the same resolution um, in height, so 256. And then I created a lot of rules to keep it consistent because the backgrounds then ended up with another colleague. Like I was doing the backgrounds, I cannot do anything, everything, let's get another colleague to do the backgrounds. And so that started helping. But I was still doing the characters and the moments and the interviews and all of this stuff. So, there were all these rules here, uh, which also took into account the speech balloons. So because the characters were always in the same position, the actual balloons were always in the same position. We didn't have to guess most of the time where the character was. It was very easy to do. So lots of great backgrounds. Um, I was just putting animation on, you know, on those arcades. I was trying to put in the doors, putting everything in place. Um, these are my drawings, which are horrible because I was wearing multiple hats, so I didn't have to communicate with that many people. So I just did them as fast as I could and then would explain in an email or text, okay, this is this, this is that. So again, a lot of rules, like no straight lines, everything has curved lines in pixel art, always looks cool. No pure black or white, black, pure black was only for the text and for the highlights of the character, so the player would always know, ah, this is for me to pick up, right? So very easy. Um, there was you know, always the same location for doors, no big shadows, big lights. So again, giving myself tools for me to speed things up, right? And you can see here, this is the full map of, of, the, of the game, and this is like multiple screens stitched together of the main street. And uh, the main street is, is this one over here. And this is like the tutorial when you start, and then these are all the, the places you can go. And this one over here, which is the hotel, the hotel actually has a funny thing, which is there's infinite number of floors. 
and I made it on purpose. It was a running joke, but also like, oh, we need another floor to, because there's another quest, we need another character, we just create another floor, that's okay, there you go. Um, they were all multi-layered because you needed to take into account the characters walk there, so you have backgrounds and foregrounds. Again, the singers are outlined in black because you can talk with them. And this is the bedrooms of the hotel. They all have different pieces and colors, so you, every time you walk into a hotel room, it could have different variations of itself, with drawers open, drawers closed, a different thing, blah, 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 two pillows, one pillow, you know, all those kinds of things. And, um, you know, and then it goes on, for example, to make it the, the street look busy without having to draw a lot of characters and cars, every non-interactable character is just in black. Like, you know that you can interact with a colored character and everything else is just scenery. And it feels like it's a lived-in city with a lot of elements, but in reality, it's always the same cars that are passing by, right? So, simple trick. So, the final script was around 50,000 words, Portuguese and English. Uh, but then there was a big problem. The, low, the res was so low that you couldn't read anything. So the final version of the game runs at twice the resolution. Each pixel actually occupies four pixels. That meant that the font suddenly could be a bigger resolution or more detail. So the, only the font is running at the actual game resolution and then everything else is doubled in size, if that makes sense. Oh, there you go. So the game, if you haven't played it, has interviews, like Pokemon battles, but it's interviews, so you interview characters. So again, same deal, they're always in the same position. They have several animations for the states of the interview to crack them down and learn about things. There were moments in the game, I'm not going to explain what's here because it's, it's a crazy thing that Clownbot has. He has an interdimensional being living inside of him. It is also how I would explain, because Clownbot carries all the items for all the witnesses and everything. Wait a minute, where does he keep it? So he keeps it like in a black hole he has inside of him. It's, then he explains it, and there's a monster, whatever. Um, you, we did a lot of stuff, and I'll explain. I think this is the wrong slide, but I'll explain this. And so I'll get back to the first game. Then we had the first game launched in 2013, and I'll get back to that. And then we had the sequel. And obviously, when you do a sequel, you want to get bigger, better, faster, stronger, right? But I need to stay with the same style and with the same look. So, the sequel problem. Uh, we actually had a bigger, bigger 40 to, again, not that big, but everything was done. The characters, the streets, you know, I could very easily create another, a uh, bigger game. There were no sharing of sales. It went really well. We were sharing sales of the first game. People were getting money. But because we were making money, we decided, let's stop this and just start paying people directly with the budget we have. But the market had shifted, and so sales I had took a big hit, was a completely different market. I did manage to include a lot of things from fans that requested into the game, which was, you know, you always want to do with the sequel. But obviously I'm stubborn, and I kept other things that would bite me back later, because I shouldn't have done that. Quest in case, there was a lot of people that complained the game was too easy, the first one, so I make the second game super hard. And then I had a call from a reviewer, Philippe, I'm stuck here and I want to finish this review, how do I pass this puzzle? So, ah, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> right, um, so big change was now it had puzzles and minigames, which the first one didn't have. It had the new sidekick, which is the kid, everything more. Uh, I reused the art, reused the music, and yeah, I reused the animation. So, you know, make it be smart with budget. These are very low budget games. Obviously, at the time, we were already making projects for clients and other things like that. Now, the interviews, we had more money, so we hired another colleague instead of myself to animate interviews. So uh, these were animated by Uriel, who made a lot of great work with all of the characters that you need to interview. So these are three um, festival goers. They were going to festival on the train. And uh, they might be the killer of the express killer. We, we don't know. Um, and then, of course, the puzzles, minigames, they were all different. They were all completely different. There are six completely different games. Uh, again, too high from the original game. And, but again, I had no publisher. I had a company running at this point. I could take as much time as I wanted, and I did. So backgrounds continue to evolve. Now the game took place inside a train, which is a classic Portuguese train. We tried to do a, a partnership with a train company, which is CP, but we couldn't, so we changed it to L. And that's it. 
Uh, they actually wanted it, but then the administration changed, you know, political things. Then the people that were there were no longer there. I couldn't make the deal. Same trick as before. <laughs> Trains are always the same, right? So you just change a few things and suddenly you have a completely different train car. Uh, this was first class, so very posh. They have a, a snooker table and everything. Uh, and actually, the bathroom, if you go in, uh, it's like a huge old division, like huge, doesn't make any sense. I still had time to make a lot of the art, like the, the locomotive there and other things around the game. And I had time to make the animations for moments when some characters appear and they do important things and you want to grab the attention of the player. Um, how it was done, doesn't matter. Again, I'm very messy, so it's, I'm, I'm horrible with this stuff. I just draw as fast as I can. We managed to make a lot of new animations in-game that the player was not expecting, so we would get some surprises. Um, and we actually did the actual protagonist of the game goes back in time into the actual 80s and, uh, and then everything looks exactly like the spectrum palette should have been. So this is how the game should have looked like if I did it exactly like an 80s game in Basique uh, in the spectrum. Uh, I think this slide, again, this slide was here for some reason. So editions, let's start to, yeah, yeah, we did a lot of, I have a lot of those pins still. Some of them are rusty. Uh, so the game launched on our own website. You could pay by PayPal, Visa, you know, was great because we only took a 5% cut instead of the 30% from Steam. Uh, we did a torrent version, so we were, we, Madonna was doing this at the time, she, Madonna would launch a, a CD, and it was not the real CD, it was like a fake thing, and then everybody was downloading it and sharing, so suddenly you didn't have the Madonna CD. We did the same thing. We created a fake version of the game that actually had a little pirate in there that would pop up at some point and say, hey, you are playing the pirated version of the game, but your save still functions in the original, so you can buy it. Then it had the link and you could buy it with installing the correct folder and everything. Then we launched it in Steam, which was a huge success. We made uh, a university, so these are the traditional, uh, um, what do you call it in English, the traditional capes of Portuguese uh, when they go to university. So we did a version that was for free, a short DLC, uh, about that, which was called Gang das Capas Negras, and I'm, I don't know if I'm going to try and translate this. We did a small game for Android and iOS that actually was a, a little bit of the game that went into to that. We actually ported the game, then we released the, uh, the expansion on Steam, and finally in 2020 the game was ported uh, to the Nintendo Switch. It had multiple versions, I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but basically, we did update the game a bunch of times uh, so it could work on Nintendo and it was ready for other consoles. Very proud that because I was in charge of all the art, I was actually saving it with a limited palette, which meant the original game only occupies 40 megabytes. So when we ported it to Android and iOS, pff, it was so small. It was amazing. Uh, what happens is when you run the game, it unpacks and it's huge, right? Same with the sequel. Uh, and then we had a lot of fun with marketing. We did a lot of stuff. This is an actual Portuguese band that recorded a, a track that you can listen to on Spotify. Uh, we did cross promotions, we did posters. This is on the Wafel, so that's a waffle there. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. This is one of the most interesting stories. This is at Microsoft Portugal, the headquarters. And we actually, on their, one of their main events, we were speaking. And they ask us, what do you want to put on the goodie bag to distribute to everybody? And we're talking major corporations they said bananas. What do you mean bananas? We want to put bananas because we're nerd monkeys and we do the banana jam. And so people got bananas from nerd monkeys and it got viral, which was great. Another viral one. Uh, at some point during the production of the first in, in downtown Lisbon, well, center of Lisbon, I would say, I saw this poster and said, well, wouldn't it be nice? We have only 25K of, for, we don't have any money for marketing. Wouldn't it be nice if one day we could do that? And yeah, and then I started looking, wait a minute, we have Photoshop. So I took a bunch of pictures, I got to the office, I put this, and I, when I put it on Facebook, it became viral. It was like, even one of the investors called Yogo up, you spent money on this huge post, are you crazy? And said, no, it's fake, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so that worked. And again, we did so much stuff that was fun uh, it did not generate by itself a lot of sales, but it did generate momentum to the games paid themselves. Uh, it, was, it was really, really cool. So what is the conclusion? 
here after the disaster that you saw, right? Uh, we did manage to release them on as many screens as possible because the games were made for that. Uh, they were profitable. They took a few years, but they were both profitable, which was great. It established what is today Nerd Monkeys. I'm not no longer uh, uh, um, uh, with Nerd Monkeys. I left in 2018, and Diogo is now running Nerd Monkeys. I did what I wanted to do. Diogo did what he wanted to do. And what did I wanted to do? Uh, I wanted to do a Spectrum game. Remember, so I did that. Now. Looking at the Portuguese industry to the first slides that you saw, it has come a long way. We currently can count around 80 companies plus, and these numbers are from one to two years ago, so it might increase. We have over 1,000 devs working in games. We have a lot of games made in Portugal, also games in pixel art. We have companies moving in. You all know this. There's a lot of companies moving in here, uh, including my own, Mr. Kite, which was in London, decided to come to Lisbon. Plenty of universities and courses available everywhere. Uh, books that were published, actually these two already have a few years. would be great if we had a few more. Lots of events, including this one, right? We got DevGam just did here today, is, is, is here. Um, and the community has grown. And I finished paying off Under Siege two years ago. <laughs> For those of you who wanted to hear about it, it took over 10 years. And my colleagues did their own thing. And I'm not going to say how they did it and what they did. I did, took a while. Uh, and I got to pretend I was actually back in the 80s with a special edition in cassette of Merlin Hotel Lisbon. Now, the game is not actually on the tape, there's a code. In the tape is the soundtrack, okay? But this special edition we sent to a lot of reviewers and they were like, this is so cool, but I don't have a tape deck to listen to. So yeah, I'll just put it on the side. Uh, and this is the last factory that exists, I don't know if it's still alive, in the the Iberian Peninsula, this was the last factory in Maya in the north. And they said that our master was perfect. They did not have to touch it. When I sent the master of the audio, they said, this is the best master we ever got. I said, we just put that zero, the decibels, to make sure it's always there. And everyone's like, no, this is good. So, OK, cool. So yeah, so thank you for this. This is postmortem of both games with that introduction. And I'm now open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very interesting talk with so many random stuff, as well as a slide with buttons that we s we hear that was not intended. What's about that slide? Uh, so that slide is those are um, badges, like little little um, pins, like there are pins, and it was I wanted to do something with that slide because I I did this presentation in the summer after. I, I got confirmed I was doing this, and then I left it there. I was like, why do I have this here? I'll come around to it, right? And just stay there. So I don't remember why I put it there. Yeah, so because it was two times, so I was like, whoa. Yeah, it, it was a break, <laughs> and then on that break, either I had music, and I was, it's like. OK, uh, well, nice. Well. OK, anyone else, uh, any question? OK. Mm -hmm. No? Oh, that was like uh, <laughs> was a movement of a uh, question. Okay. Yes. Yeah, is this working? Yeah. Um, I just want to ask, how do you feel the Portuguese game industry is nowadays? Do you feel like it's growing at a good rate and in the right direction? Or is it not up to you? What do you, what do you think would be your idea? Uh, it's, it's going in a very good direction because you still have the indie devs that are doing the thing. They, can, they are getting funds, uh, not only on the mainland, but in the islands. We're talking about that today. And uh, you have companies that are moving in that are coming for creating outsourcing, not just creating new games, but outsourcing, which is a bit more stable sometimes. Uh, and you have companies buying other companies. So you have the Funcom that bought ZPX, and you have Sabre that bought um, the original Big Moon in the, uh, in the, in the north, right? So that's, that's happening, and it's, it's an exponential rate if you look at it. Unfortunately, it's a young industry or a very... Uh, not young, but it's very badly documented. And so we don't have reports of every year of what's happening. We have a report in 2020 or 21. We don't have any more. And now, like I'm top of my head, I have to get some numbers here and there. So it's going really well. And again, one of the reasons DevGam is here, because probably the organizers saw and say, hey, this is a cool place to do the event. There's devs there, right? So, so yeah, it is. It is going very well. Thank, thank you, and thank you for the homage you made to Portugal, 80s Portugal, with your game. So, yeah, cool. Thank you. Really nice. Uh, if no other, I have another question. Lift, um, 
Well, if the knowledge of before, what would you do different if you would start like a game or a game studio? Uh, uh, we, we did everything right. As you saw, there was something that happened with the, with the hacking that basically destroyed our, our reasoning was good, which was, uh, you know, we built a company, we had our own technology, we had our own money, we get extra funds. And all throughout the way, especially with Under Siege, we consulted constantly if we're going in the right direction. And we started getting good feedback. Edge did a feature because of what we were doing. Back then, it was nor normal for real-time game, real-time strategy, or tactics, plus editor, plus all these things. So everyone was like, this is going to sell. Plus, at the digital market in 2011, if you remember, PlayStation 3 had two games coming out per week. So you had the whole week of marketing for yourself in another game. So the strategy was sound. We, we, I would do the same. If I known, I would not. I would have released it earlier, obviously, because then it wouldn't have caught the the hackers. But uh, I would do exactly the same all over again. No, no. It's like what happened was really just unfortunate. I thought the hacking uh, thing with the pirate was really that was really smart. Like with that, they are oh. hacking it, and then they suddenly, oh well, you are in a hack version. So yeah. that's really smart. It, it probably gave us uh, a, a month of sales. Uh, we don't know, right? But. At the time, I remember going to the torrent sites, and the people were actually laughing and replying in the torrent. This is really fun and interesting how you did it, because people, when you, you people when they pirate the game and download it, they don't play it right away. So it took a while for people to catch up. It was in the middle of the game that the pirate popped up. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Any other question? Yes. yes sir. Also, delete. I deleted the rest of the content to make sure they couldn't hack it to keep playing. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, what advice would you give to somebody starting now into this? So we have a, a there's a bunch of new kids, you know, people in universities. You start getting courses and stuff like this. So if somebody wants to get into um, indie development, right? Or would you even advise not getting into indie development? But what would you advise to people that want to get into the industry and start doing things? Uh, big one. Um, okay, um, don't do what I did, right? Don't put your own money. That's that's number one. Like, don't I never? One of the things I never did was I never put money from family ever. Don't ever do that. That's the wrong way to go. So, um, don't put your own money or bank money. Try to make your first game as you go along. Right? Try it to do it. We actually started that way. We're doing on weekends and at night, and at some point we got investment. Then that's when we funded the company. So, only fund the company on like the launch day if you can. Because that's when you need to get, of course, you can do that because Steam, you have to put the page with the company already created and all that. But to get the benefits of sales, try to make the game with no loans, no, no investments. Do it yourself and your friends for the first game and push it out there. And only go into this craziness of funds and European funds and all of that when the company is already established and you have money from sales. So that's my big takeaway is do the game anyway but try to do it without getting money from any source that you need to then give it back, right? Uh, even family. Uh, family will bite you in the ass, like, where's my money? Gave you money 10 years ago, where is it? So, so yeah. Okay, any other question on this regard? Okay, then I just like to ask this question just because of randomness. What's your favorite game? I actually saw a tweet that PlayStation 4 turned 10 and uh, the, one of the games that came out was Resogun. And I really like that game. I really always liked, sh because of the games I used to play in the past, I always liked shooters, that little spaceships with very tight mechanics. So that's a big one. And then the second one would be probably Sonic or something like that. Okay, uh, classic. Yeah. Okay. And we'll like, you will continue making games, right? That's the plan. Yeah, yeah, no, there's no turning back now. I can't change my <laughs> career, no? What would I do? Maybe McDonald's or something. <laughs> okay. I don't know. No, it's, it's, it's no, no changing. I love this. Um, yeah, uh, th I already paid for, you know, loans that were <laughs> took me 10 years. So why would I go back now that I have no loans, right? Fair enough. <laughs> And will this like? Do you have a kind of a kind? Because I see you have a lot of humor in your games. Are you? Is that like your kind of benchmark thing, or is there like what is your design like brand stuff that you feel? Oh, this is really a Philippe Duarte 
game. I, I, I do a lot of silly things uh, because I feel that video games is supposed to be entertaining. Humor is really hard. Uh, the second game we tested, no, the first game we tested, there were a lot of jokes we removed because it was already out of time, like we were in another time. But like people were like, you shouldn't have this joke here or you shouldn't say this. Like where, but in the 80s, that's what they said. And same with the sequel where it was even worse, like we actually removed a few characters because there were two, stere there were big stereotypes of the 80s and they were like people getting mad. So uh, that silly humor and the trying of how do I reflect society, I really like that. But I do have uh, serious projects and serious game, but I do feel that video games should be entertaining and when they should be, they should go over the top and be as fun as they can be. So that's, that's why I made these two games to be you know, well, re if you read reviews, Americans hated it. Y French people love them. So it's like, you know, <laughs> but I like that dichotomy where there's people uh, in the planet that hate this thing. And there's like in Europe, mostly Europe people loved it, like Germans and French. But your Americans like, this is so stupid. This is, how can this be published? It's, those reviews are up. Like, I don't care. <laughs> okay, lovely. Interesting view. Any other questions? We have still some time before the break, but otherwise, uh, I think. Oh yes, I knew it! I knew you were going to say, ask a question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question. I, I entered mid presentation, so I didn't catch that initial part. But regarding funding, and I heard you said something about like make a game that is profitable without considering even the funding part, but. Imagine imagining you are starting now the um, your first game uh, launching in a, a non-existing um, company or a studio. Uh, what would you recommend now? Uh, imagining that you have an idea for a game, you want to publish it. Uh, would you still uh, do this uh, this process of creating a game, disregarding funding from the start and making a, as a side project? Or, um, but yeah, I actually have a few side projects. I always have things, side projects, where I'm not putting any money in. Like, I actually uh, do my own comic books, for example. And those I don't put, like, I, I do them, I have a publisher, but I, the deal with the publisher will publish when it's done. So I do it very slowly over many years. And when they are done, here's another one. So that's an example of what I do. Like, I have my actual work that pays me, which is in this case, video games. And then I have a hobby, and this is what I would recommend, is you flip it, you have your work or your studying, then you're doing video games and you take as much time as you want. If a publisher comes around, gives you money, great, right? But then you'll have a, a, a commitment, right? And then you have to hurry because it's full of bugs, you need to fix them, and I have my job, right? So no publisher is the freedom of you publish it when you think it's ready to go. Um, and I forgot what was the question all about. It was more regarding the types of funding you oh, considered okay. throughout the project. So with the publisher, now we will go into a different topic, but if, if you find a publisher that is willing to give you the money, but you don't lose the intellectual property, which is very rare, they always want every, they want everything, right? So that's great. Like the only thing that most of these publishers want is if it goes bad, then they take over. Like, okay, the code is not, I don't care, the game's already made enough, so you take the code and you take the arts and whatever. We ha I had, I, I did some math the other day, I had 30 games published, made, and I have another 30 prototypes, demos, complete games that never made it out. There was a game in Nerd Monkeys that the publisher, um, I don't think I can tell the name yet of the pub. I don't remember what's on the contract, they pulled the plug, the funding, the game was halfway. And when they decided that was in the contract that everything is theirs now, which is like absolutely horrible. So, but at least they paid up to that point. We had everything paid for, and then that's it. We're free. Okay, you don't want to pop horrible for the team, but at least there's no debt. And you learn. We were talking about this. You learn with the experience, right? Mm -hmm. you, you learn by doing it. We because you didn't see the initial slides before the digital stores of Apple and Steam. The only way to get a game out there was in the box. So you needed to get a publisher. But after that, you don't need to do it. And if you don't need to do it, that's why Murder Hotel Lisbon was launched on our own website with a little apps of Visa, PayPal. 
because we were like, uh, we want the mi minimum intermediary possible, just like takes three to five percent those those pay things, um, and then we got the Steam. But so yeah, it's it's uh, go if you have a publisher, be careful. But if they pay for you for everything, you know, great, just take it because it's your first game. Yeah, at least you'll did something, right? It's the first game; doesn't matter. In the second game, you'll negotiate with the publisher maybe and try to get some more. Yeah, just with negotiation, like like that you're going to bargain with your publisher. Like, is that like common, or because you say like later on, I just realized maybe I should have rethought about this part in our contract. Like, is that like the afterwards you were like, oh, I need to like really be prepared of that, or is that like just a common thing in in the publisher world? Uh, it is common that books, movies, games, all the publishers try to get as much as they can. <laughs> Uh, and if you don't have an agent, they will. Uh, you can find it on a video game scale because normally publishers only are interested in you when you already have a prototype or a demo, right? If I had something to show, you can say, well, I'll go to another publisher or publish it myself. Now, publishers do have a lot of choice. So they can be picky about the game they want. But when they really want your game, you can find it and say, can we change this? It doesn't hurt anybody. Oh, I spoke, you get a lawyer, you pay 200, 300 euros, can you look at my contract? And the lawyer will say, well, maybe this clause is too bad, right? Or this one here, and then you just talk with them. And so when you negotiate, even if they don't accept your learning how to negotiate in the next contract, you can go, oh, publisher, and you immediately go, wait, but I want you to, because publishers say, okay, you get X percent for royalties after we break even. That's the common thing. It's like after they pay themselves back is when you get the money back. But what does that actually mean? Is it? The money they gave you plus the money they spent. Wait, wait a minute. How much are you going to spend, and and what? So it needs to go into the contract like a number, right? So they say, oh, we're still spending on marketing. We can't start paying you royalties. But game's already profitable. Yeah, we're still paying stuff we spent on our producer and stuff like that. So you learn, right? And uh, the more you negotiate with the publisher, the better. But it, you need to have a strong gain. Otherwise, they'll say, oh, so I don't want your gain. You know, whatever. Get out of here. Okay. Yes. So. Uh, if I'm a young uh, game developer here in Portugal, I have my own Patrick, um, passion project, I have my team, where should I go to look for publishers here? Uh, well, I think at DevGam you do have already a few contacts here. Hmm. Some people here that are from publishers that are looking around those games that are there. Yeah. So if you had your game there, you would probably get a few lookers. Even if they aren't publishers, somebody will say, like me, oh, have you seen that game? It's, nobody's publishing it. Maybe I'll talk with a friend next week. And did you see that, right? So you need to stand out. You need to go to events to, to show your game, right? And um, next is you want to be uh, a pain in the ass, basically. You want to constantly, you want to constantly pester everybody all the time, uh, like and go to them, send emails, and so you need to go after it, right? Because it's going to be your first. But if your game is amazing and you are in a show and somebody sees it, it will be picked up immediately. There's no way around. Mm -hmm. It needs to be amazing. So yeah. hope it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> Just a final question. Is it possible to re-release like um, a remastered version of Under Siege now? Maybe. Uh, uh, so when Nerd, I don't know how much time we have, but when Nerd Monkeys was established and because uh, the original company Seed Studios bankrupted. After a while, the, uh, uh, IP, the, pro uh, the intellectual property of Under Siege and the whole source code was for sale by the, the government administrator of Portugal to put it on sale. And Diogo, which I was with NerdMonkeys, we went to that guy. He, he went, not me. And he said, I'll buy it. And the guy had no idea how much it was worth. So he sold to NerdMonkeys for 500 euros, the, the entire thing. So Diogo has since then, I told him, it's a bad idea because you will never remaster it. It's our own engine from programmers that are now in Sony and everywhere else. So to just port it, a thing that was programmed for those very specific CPUs that are so specific of PlayStation 3, right? Uh, with the SDK of our engine, it's going to be a bunch of work. Now, the assets are 3D, so they scale up nicely, right? But the textures don't. So you need to redo the textures and all that. Uh, so Diogo actually was, was trying to do that, and I think he got somewhere, but when you don't have a successful game, why would you want to remaster? Right? You do a remaster of success. Oh, I know this game. I want to play it again. Or you got a remaster of a game you've never heard of. What is this? A remaster of something that came out 15 years ago. Nobody cares. 
right? <laughs> would you care? You would, but because you know me and you know the game, right? Yeah.